From the studios of KENW on the campus of Eastern New Mexico University, it's You Should Know, featuring the people and events of Eastern New Mexico and West Texas. With me now is Dr. James Murphy. Dr. Murphy is a board-certified comprehensive ophthalmologist. Um, and uh, Dr. Murphy, we're in the age where it, everybody is looking at a screen of some sort, uh, either, the, either a smartphone or their computer at work. Uh, and we want to talk to you about eye strain. Tell me a little about yourself. What is your background in ophthalmology? Well, I am, uh, so as you said, I'm a, a board certified ophthalmologist, but I also did a fellowship or a subspecialty in glaucoma, um, which, you know, that, that, that was, was all in, in New York. Um, I'm originally from Wisconsin. Ah, and I, this is great for us because we're, we're down here in New Mexico, but you speak Spanish very well, uh, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I um, I I double majored in biochemistry and then Spanish linguistics in college, and you know I had a really good friend growing up who uh, you know his his parents were Spanish speaking in the home, and so I just kind of always grew up around that, and it has been easily as useful for me in my career as my actual medical education, just being able to speak Spanish. So, <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, tell me. Uh, about the problems that have been caused for you and other ophthalmologists by the this intense use of small screens big screens all everything that we look at and see uh, what, what kind of problems does it cause you as an ophthalmologist and your patients your, the, the problems really are your patients problems yeah well, you know, screens are inherently a low contrast source of reading material. So, you know, even when you're looking at a screen, you know, it may be a, a lighter background with darker font, for example, but that font is actually backlit LED or whatever the source OLED. And so it's not quite as deeply dark or absence of light. And so built into really every screen in its inherent, you know, luminescence, is a reduction in the amount of contrast uh, that it can provide. And so the human eye is built to use contrast to be able to see small print. The more contrast you have, the smaller the print you are able to read. Um, you know, and also, even if you're farsighted or nearsighted or anything, or, or have no need for prescription, the more contrast you have, the less likely your eyes are to develop that, what we call that eye strain that occurs commonly in the workplace with people in front of their screens for hours at a time or sometimes the entire day. So I can understand eye strain. Uh, my eyes the, and everybody's eyes, the iris, uh, it, it, it stops down when things get bright. It, it gets smaller. It opens up when things are darker, and uh, I can see where contrast would be a big problem for the eyes. But are there muscles in the eyes that do that? W w what does that? You, you should know that physically, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. The eye is a muscle. And I mean, really, the, the iris, the, that contains a muscle. You know, it has the muscles for dilating the pupil and for constricting the pupil. Um, and it's interesting because you say, you know, the, the, the size of the pupil or the size of your pupil when you're reading whatever material it is that you read will determine how much optical aberration or blurriness there is to what it is that you're looking at. So typically people, when they're on a screen, oftentimes they're indoors, the, sc the screen doesn't emit as much in highly intense light as say outside in the sun or anywhere outdoors. Um, and so your pupils are a little bit bigger on average reading from a screen than they would be, say, for example, if you were outside or next to a window in broad daylight with the sunlight 
bouncing off the page and entering your eye that way, much higher contrast where you'd have a smaller pupil. And so the situation that causes is any sort of inherent farsightedness or nearsightedness or um, even a mild prescription that maybe you wouldn't need to utilize if you were reading a book broad daylight from a printed text, you actually might need that prescription to be able to effectively read from a screen at the same size font um, because the pupil is larger and that will highlight or sort of magnify some of that those small refractive changes or need for glasses that people you know may just kind of walk around from day to day and not actually wear glasses even though they do have a little bit of need for glasses okay how can people are there what are some ways people can prevent eye strain sounds to me like uh, if you're a tennis player and you play too many games of tennis in a day, uh, your muscles get strained. Same thing happens to your eye when you're dealing with contrast on a computer or, or on your telephone. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a little bit different because distance and up close are two different things. When you're when you're when you're playing tennis, typically that's primarily distance vision, and the, the muscles in your eye to help focus are actually relaxed in when you're focusing in the distance state. However, when you're on a computer, which isn't you know maybe only a few feet away from you or at the edge of your desk, if you're on a laptop only a few feet away, and certainly if you're trying to read like a prescription bottle, the muscle that helps you focus in your eye is actually activated, and so that those those arm's length and closer activities are what primarily cause that eye strain. So how often should people take a break? Uh, let's say that your, your whole job is using that computer all day long. Uh, is it half an hour? I mean, af I mean, after half an hour, you should take a break after an hour. What, how long? Well, so, what has been recently popularized by just the wide use of screens is the 20 20 20 rule and so and that's just because it's it's like you know sort of catchy and it's easy to remember um you know everyone remembers 2020 when they go to their eye doctor's office mm -hmm. but really what that means is for every 20 minutes that you're in front of a screen you're supposed to take a break for about 20 seconds and you're supposed to focus not on your screen or whatever is right in front of you, but something at least 20 feet away, which is basically across the room, essentially. Now, taking a 20 second break every 20 minutes for somebody who's working nine to five in front of a screen, that might disrupt their productivity. It may lead, it's, it's just maybe not as practical of advice in today's day and age as people probably want to hear. So you can, I mean, and that's just general guidelines. You can modify those guidelines, say every two hours, you can just take a five minute break. And the best thing to do is focus on something, maybe not so much 20 feet away, but if you have a window available in the office or a small walk from your desk, you could go to the window and you could look at something much farther than something way out, you know, across the street down the road and you know you'd also have the benefit if you have a window nearby of allowing natural full spectrum light from the sun and coming from outdoors to stimulate your retina and so that sort of allows in my mind at least this is the advice that i give to my patients the best way to reduce eye strain get a little bit of natural light in your eye really focus super far away not just 20 feet um, and then it's a little bit more practical because people can't take a break every single 20 minutes throughout their work day or they would never get anything done. Now, in my experience, I've seen a lot of children using screens. Uh, little ones that they have games on, bigger ones they may be doing their homework. And we, we've gone through a time now in the United States when we expected the children to learn at home. And so they were on that screen a lot because their teacher was there instead of them going to the classroom. Has that, it, should we have our children uh, go to ophthalmologists and be checked for this? Absolutely. Having a well visit with an ophthalmologist, either a comprehensive ophthalmologist or maybe even a pediatric ophthalmologist, 
is always a good idea. Um, and, and the reason is, is because we may not, we may not actually notice if our children are having difficulty seeing. I mean, kids, the eye muscle that helps people focus when you're, when you're, you know, less than five years old is really, is, is quite strong, much stronger than if you're in your twenties or thirties or forties. Um, and so kids have a, a high degree of, a, of a ability to accommodate through any refractive error or being farsighted or nearsighted. So a lot of times, and kids are just, a lot of times they're not complainers. They go to school, maybe they can't see the board, but they may not bring that to anybody's attention. Um, and so those cues being, being not present, it's always a good idea to have a one-time visit with an ophthalmologist sometime, you know, as, as early as possible, even, even within a year of age. Um, and that's because th this also is able to help screen for the prevention of amblyopia, which is more commonly known as lazy eye. If a infant is born with a large refractive difference, so one eye is normal and one eye is nearsighted or farsighted, that large difference can cause that child to develop amblyopia or a lazy eye quite at an early age. And if that, that child is screened by an ophthalmologist in advance, we can do patching, we can do glasses, um, you know, we can do eye drops to help minimize the, the, the worsening of lazy eye, um, which is instrumental in, in preserving good binocular stereo vision um, that you're gonna need the rest of your life. So it's a very critical part of any child's um, life in terms of um, vision development. Speaking of doing, you know, needing vision for the rest of your life, uh, when people begin to age, uh, is it important for them to have their eyes checked on a regular basis? Absolutely. People's eyes will very commonly drift and change with time in terms of what their prescription is. I'm sure there's people out there that, you know, they go to their eye doctor every couple of years, even when they're younger, um, and their prescription changes. So if you don't go to your eye doctor and you don't, you're not screened and tested for that small, normal change in prescription that occurs over time, um, then you're just walking around with glasses that are not optimized. So if you're a 25 year old and you've got your glasses on and you're sitting at your desk looking at this, at your computer screen, if you're wearing a glasses prescription that's a couple of years old and is out of date and not fully correcting your vision to make it as good as it can be, you're going to experience eye strain from that screen much more rapidly than you would otherwise if you had an up-to-date prescription. Can eye strain lead to some of the, the eye diseases or problems that we're familiar with? Uh, too much pressure in the eye, uh, the retina coming loose, those sorts of things? Yeah, typically in terms of a retinal detachment, um, you know, having not up to date glasses prescription doesn't 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 directly lead to that. However, there, you know, dry eyes and ocular surface disease will be exacerbated by by eye strain because when you're at the computer or your screen and you're straining to see your, your blink rate goes down. So you, there's a natural reflex for us to blink that happens about once every 12 seconds. We don't have to think about blinking for it to occur. It just happens naturally. Um, every time you blink, there are glands in the eyelid that secrete you know, a layer of oil onto the surface of the eye. And then your lacrimal gland also secretes that, that watery layer. So, so the tear film is actually, there's actually quite a bit of structure to it in multiple layers. And if you're not blinking at a normal rate and you're straining your eyes, that's going to lead to ocular surface disease, meibomian gland dysfunction, dry eyes is affecting many, many people throughout the, the world as a result of extended screen time. And so all of these, if, you, if you're aware of your prescription, you have it up to date, you see an eye doctor on a regular basis, they can detect if you are having some, some symptoms related to these and treat it if necessary. Let, let me ask you, there uh, are a lot of people uh, around us where we are here in New Mexico who deal with wind. They work outside, there's a lot of wind, uh, sometimes there's dust in the air. Uh, 
can the wind actually lead to dry eyes uh, and cause problems? Yeah, I mean, it, it can definitely exacerbate dry eyes. Um, if you have a deficient oily layer of your tear film and it's a windy day, you're going to have immediate evaporation of that watery layer of your tear film right away. If you work in a windy environment, it makes sense to use some kind of eye protection just to reduce or minimize the amount of evaporation that is occurring right off the surface of your eye and also prevent debris from entering the surface of the eye too and sticking to it. That's happening to everybody on a daily basis constantly. Your tear film is protecting your, the surface of your eyes from all the debris that's just floating in the air normally. Um, if, you, if you work in a windy environment, it's especially important to have some sort of eye protection to prevent this. Because I can't tell you how many times that I've seen someone in the office where they're working at their job and, and you know, a, a piece of debris flies into the eye and then it becomes stuck there and it needs to be removed with either a needle or a small micro forcep. It, just so you can imagine what this is like, uh, think about driving down a road at 40 miles an hour and you stick your head out and the 40 mile an hour <laughs> wind is coming into your eyes. We do, we do have problems out here. I know it, it's hard to see. I, I just wondered if it would do damage. Does it, can it really do damage to your eyes if you're not wearing goggles like a race car driver would? Absolutely. Not only can those small foreign bodies stick to the surface of the eye and then become lodged within the eye, but you can have a you can have a you can have one of those pieces of debris penetrate full thickness through your cornea and enter the eye. So you could actually have a perforation too. And unfortunately, I've seen that not uncommonly in my career. Um, so so it's it's kind of an ever present danger. Um, and I think if anything, you know, people working in the backyard with weed whippers and lawnmowers, people tend to not wear or forget the dangers that doing those activities poses to their eye. And I can't tell you how many times that I've seen someone in the office who probably should have been wearing safety glasses or protective glasses and wasn't, and they end up having a problem or an infection or, you know, a corneal laceration or, you know, damage to the surface of their eye that, sometimes can heal and they can have full visual recovery, but oftentimes it can result in a, in a scar to the surface of the cornea and then really permanent visual damage. There are a number of products and, uh, and vitamins and things that uh, tell us in articles that we read online or, or in magazines uh, that you take this and this is really going to help your eyes. You're, you're going to be seeing better, all these sorts of things. Is nutrition a problem? And uh, can you really stop worrying about going to the eye doctor just because you're taking certain vitamins? Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a nuanced topic. I, I have people ask me all the time or they bring in a bottle of vitamins that they got online or they got at a pharmacy you know, with various claims and the problem with uh, nutritional supplements in the United States is they are really, they're not regulated by the FDA. Um, and so if it's not a medication, if it's just a nutritional supplement, for example, um, they can really make whatever claim that they want to um, without really having any substantiating evidence to back that or support that claim. Um, really the one well-studied I vitamin that you see on the counters at a lot of pharmacies is, is meant for age-related macular degeneration. And that is, it's not just everybody who has that condition, but a very specific subset of those patients who have intermediate stage age-related macular degeneration. Um, you know, and so while taking a dietary supplement is usually, although not always, um, unlikely to harm you or do harm, Really, it's, it's just a, an expensive supplement that there is very little research, if any well-structured, rigorous studies designed to really prove that, that that supplement is actually doing what it claims to do. In other words, if you eat a good diet and uh, you're not gaining weight, you're not losing weight, you're, 
you're getting along, you're eating your vegetables, all of those kinds of things, probably your eyes are being taken care of as well. Yeah. I always tell people healthy body, healthy eyes, good, clean, healthy living, exercise, you know, eat right, your eyes are going to be happy. Good. Let's talk about refocus. Tell me about refocus. You work for with refocus. Uh, tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, Re refocus is a. Uh, I mean, it's a large entity. They um, they have been acquiring practices um, throughout Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut. So they're really all over the Northeast, and um, you know, so they have quite a large portfolio of doctors, really encompassing all of the surgical subspecialties um, that one could need within the space of ophthalmology. Um, you know, so I've been working for them for going on a year now, and it's been an excellent experience. Um, you know, it's, uh, they're very fair employers. They, you know, help us streamline our workflow um, so that we're able to more effectively and more efficiently um, provide appropriate care for all of our patients. And as you know, there's, there's, there's less ophthalmologists than there really needs to be in the United States to serve our population. Um, you know, and so any added efficiency that we can gain to be able to see more patients is always a benefit. And uh, at, do you help recruit more ophthalmologists? Uh, is that part of the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, within, within the ophthalmology community, you know, everybody knows everybody. It's a very small community. Of, of every graduating medical school class in the United States, really only 1% of that graduating class becomes ophthalmologists ultimately. So everybody knows everybody. You know, if, if Refocus uh, approached a, another glaucoma specialist for a job opportunity in another state, typically I'll get a call or an email um, through the American Glaucoma Society or one of our professional networks, just asking my opinion and how my experience has been. So we're, we're all very close, tight knit, um, you know, and, and I'm familiar with, with subspecialists and comprehensive ophthalmologists around the country. We talked for a moment about children having problems. We'll go back to the subject of eye strain. Um, if, do you have any advice for parents in terms of a way they can get their children to take a break every now and then. I, I watch my grandchildren and it just worries me. Uh, they're just looking down all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, I see it all the time too, where parents, you know, are out with their children and their children are maybe sitting at the dinner table at a restaurant and the parents are engaging and the, and the two or three kids are all on their, you know, their tablets or their smartphones basically. Um, but, you know, I know the, the American Academy of Ophthalmology um, does recommend that, you know, under the age of two, that there is no screen time at all. Um, and between the ages of two and five, that that screen time is limited to less than one hour a day. Now, that might seem difficult because just sitting at a table for dinner trying to keep your, your four-year-old happy, that might be over an hour right there. Um, but research has shown us that children under the age of five um, who are on, who have screen time that's greater than two hours a day, they are more likely to develop learning disabilities, um, attention deficits like ADHD or ADHD, um, and have more difficulty interacting with their peers when ultimately they end up attending school. And so really all of those problems, um, you know, are concerning. And so you know, I'm, I'm actually expecting my first child um, at the end of October. And, you know, I, I'm, not a, a, I'm not a parent yet, but I will try and stick to some of those guidelines as best as I can. That's great advice. Should parents then uh, not just accept and say, well, ah, the kid's only four, there's nothing wrong with his eyes, uh, but actually include an ophthalmologist in the different kinds of examinations that you have for children as they're growing up. Uh, all, and you'll find this out, by the way, all moms and dads 
want to know if their child is in the right height for that age. They, you know, they like to know all of these different things. They should probably see a vision specialist as well, shouldn't they? Absolutely. I, I think it is super important for every child to have their vision screened um, really within the first year of life, if possible, if not within the first one or two years of life um, or sooner. Um, if you see any misalignment of the eyes, you go to see an ophthalmologist immediately. Um, and that's once again, just to prevent that, the, the development of lazy eye, which can very rapidly become permanent and lead to permanent loss of binocular vision with as they get older. So the magic there is make them wear those glasses, even though it might be hard. Well, Dr. Murphy, we, we appreciate uh, <clears throat> you as a, as a physician and all physicians for what you go through to get to be called doctor. And we, we do appreciate that. I certainly appreciate your talking to me now. I think this will be of a lot of help to our viewers out here in New Mexico. And uh, uh, we, we wish you well with that new child. And uh, that, that's, that's, that's just great. Thank you very much for being on. And thank you for watching. Thank you.